This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. I love this company, and I don't want to see it go. The end of the season last year was uh, one of the most incredibly awful moments of our lives. We managed to push back and successfully gain the support necessary to move the company forward into the 2015 season. <laughs> And I think that the support that we got from the community in San Diego, from the opera community uh, nationwide, actually even worldwide, uh, helped us you know, push forward into the 2015 season. And right now, um, it, it appears that the funding goals are, are well within reach, the ticket sales are, um, are, are good, and we have a very positive feeling about going into our 50th anniversary season. As a high school student in San Diego in 1965, I saw this theater open up with a brand new production of La Boheme built by the opera. And since that time, um, I've been lucky enough to be involved in building two new La Bohemes and then this production here that we have from English National Opera. I work very closely um, with the director who originally directed this, and we'd worked together by then for about 12 years. So we were very, it was very much a collaboration, and he simply said to me at the beginning that he was interested in doing it in this period, and uh, was interested in the photography. And then I developed it, and um, the design from that very simple conversation. Whenever I've designed anything, I've always worked through the whole piece to make sure that every single moment works. So to some extent, I think all designers direct uh, the play or the opera as they are designing. So where do we want to go? This particular set is quite specific about what, how you, where you can go and where you can't go because it's architectural. Um, and because the rooms are not enormous, you, there's not a vast amount of choice. But the, the basic choreography used in the very simplest sense, um, I guess was more or less in my head as I designed it, but not with an eye for me directing it, simply an eye for the, for the director having a, have a good, good time when he worked on it. Mimi is Alison Cambridge. <laughs> Rodolfo, Harold Mears. <laughs> Sarah, you met already, Musetta, who's bringing up the <laughs> Morgan Smith from Moby Dick is our Marcello. <laughs> Malcolm McKenzie, Chonard. And Christian Van Horn, Colline. And our Scott Sykin is Ben Wall and Alcindor. So now, gentlemen, I'm just right to go up on the set. <laughs>
I characterize Rodolfo? Well, the obvious statement is that he's a poet. We don't know exactly how good of a poet he is, <laughs> um, because clearly he makes his living um, writing articles and things like that. I think his aspiration is that's his day job, but he really is a uh, romantic at heart. So this, these, this poetry um, is very much a part of, of who he is. And he, he tends to um, live a little bit in a, a fantasy world. I think sometimes he talks about it, how, how even though I live in poverty, you know, I, I can live like a millionaire in my mind and in my soul because I have all, I have, I have rhymes, I have words, and I can, I can live in a different place. He feels things very deeply. Oh. One of the reasons he is really drawn to her is she uses his words, his poetic language that he's giving to her. She turns around and spins it right back and uses the same, same words right back to him to describe herself. That really catches him, you know, that, that she, gets, she gets me. She understands that this poetry is part of me and she's connecting with me on that level. So on, on the, the, the deepest level, of his soul, that there's a connection there immediately. I think she's heard the boys around the garret before and she's had her eye on Rodolfo. It's a convenient occurrence that she needs to go up there and ask him to, you know, light her candle. And then what happens after that, I think there is a, a shyness to her because it's perhaps the first time that she's ever felt that sort of flutter, that, oh wow, is this love at first sight? And I think that's what makes her story and her love with Rodolfo so special. I think she's a woman with a lot of passion and a lot of soul and some gumption to go up there. And I think, for me anyway, that's how I like to play her. And I think it's more realistic and believable that then Rodolfo would just be so entranced by her. And it's that much more tragic when you see her decline. I think it's wrong to sort of play her death from the beginning because you have to believe that Rodolfo sees a beautiful young woman enter into his apartment, not a sick, dying weakling. <laughs> in the trio in Act Three, after she, you know, she's been eavesdropping on Marcello and Rodolfo, she hears. Rodolfo say, Mimi is very sick. Mimi is dying. She hears him say that. She could be getting, could have obviously has been getting progressively sicker and sicker, but to hear your partner say it, she's dying. That's, it's, it's a shock to her to hear that. <laughs> I 
think that's why it's important not to play her as so tragic and dying from day one. We have the four guys, um, but um, the, the friendship in particular that's important is the one between Rodolfo and Marcello. I think they're the, the closest to. Uh, perhaps Colini and Chouinard have the similar kind of um, best buddy relationship. We don't really know. We don't get to see that. Um, but the Marcello Rodolfo relationship is, is right out there for us to see. And while they rib each other, as, as guys often do, um, when the chips are down, they're the two that are left. It's a very strong bond that the, the two of them have. Marcello is someone who is essentially ruled by his heart. He's also very much uh, one of these characters that's the glue between the other characters um, in the piece. Um, he's part friend, part psychiatrist, um, part lover, and uh, really essential to this, to this story. And I love those kinds of characters where you get to play an important role in every single act and every single scene. Um, and he's a very dynamic character. And from an acting perspective, that's also a lot of fun to kind of sink my teeth into. What really attracts Marcello to Mazzetta, I think that's really up to the performer. That's up to the, the person playing the role. Because certainly the way she acts in public and um, it's kind of it's kind of deplorable. <laughs> you know, she's completely uh, outwardly self-serving. Um, needs to be the center of attention. I see him as being deeply concerned about the turn that Musetta has made. I think he knew Musetta more as Musetta is in the fourth act. You know, someone who is deeply compassionate, sympathetic, um, one of the strongest characters by the end of the opera. Musetta is the life of the party. <laughs> she is a, a woman who has learned how to charm men and get them to give her gifts and money and things like that so that she can survive in this this world of bohemians and poverty. Um, she's in love with Marcello. Of course, Marcello doesn't have much money. I really don't think that that bothers her, but she also can't escape from the fun of chasing after all the other boys who can give her gifts. <laughs> so she's sassy and fun and flirty, and but she's also very uh, real and very compassionate in act four when she's praying as Mimi is about to die. She says, Mimi is an angel from heaven, but I, I'm not even worthy of forgiveness, but Mimi is. And I think that she's um, very pure and also honest inside of herself, even though she is frivolous and fun and sassy and all that other stuff. <laughs> she's very caring and she's very real and true and multidimensional, absolutely. <laughs>
Yes, I definitely tried to incorporate an act two in the bar scene. A lot of sassiness and physicality to try and get Marcello's um, jealousy um, heightened and get him to notice me. That's, you know, Musetta's entire goal there. And she does it in all kinds of ways by flirting and using her, her body. But, um, but they really do love each other. They just have a very difficult time of communicating with each other and making each other um, hear what is really the truth in their heart. <laughs> My favorite moment is in Act 3. My favorite moment of, of the opera in general uh, is Act 3. I have a couple of favorite moments in the opera. Uh, the first is Act 3. My favorite moment to perform uh, is my favorite moment because it's a favorite acting moment for me as, as an artist, and that's, that's really the entire third act. There's this juxtaposition of, of Mimi and Rodolfo being so tender and so loving to each other, and then Musetta and Marcello completely in that hot, heavy argument, that just crazy moment, and the irony that's there and the juxtaposition that's there, I think is so fantastic. <laughs> The obvious challenges are that you've got to put together a big chorus, a lively chorus, and at the same time follow the narrative of the couple that you've just become interested in, which is effectively at this point Rodolfo and uh, Mimi, and then they're introducing the new relationship between Marcello and Musetta, because Musetta tends to pull all the focus out of Act Two because it's such a fant she has such a fantastic aria. When we do the scene change, the chorus pours through the scenery. And so that's a very, very helpful start. And actually, the crowdedness is quite, is quite helpful. So although you could say that it's tricky to get all that chorus on stage mm. at the same time as preparing all the intimate scenes, in fact, the crush of the chorus makes it more thrilling because it makes it feel very, very lively. I think that you're able to concentrate on the principles as you need to so that you can focus in on the cafe, which is within the centre of, of all the activity. When you need to, it's just a question really of slightly, slightly shifting the lighting and slightly shifting the activity so that you, you, you lessen the activity in one area in order to concentrate on the activity in the other area. And actually, I think this is, um, uh, I think this is rather successful. So in, in, in this production, we can really get the energy and the liveliness of the chorus and follow the narrative, and follow all the details of the principles, including Musetta and her entrance and, and, her, and her aria, and all the other details of how the other principles respond. Bohème is by an Italian composer, sung in Italian, and yet to me it seems very French, and I am not sure I can tell you why, except the delicacy and the elegance of some of the motives, some of the writing, 
is never over the top. In the very intimate sections, the writing is extremely moderate. It's not bombastic. There's not an extra note in this score. Anything that's as economical and compact and forceful without hitting you over the head as this, I'm not aware of. An act that's what? 30 minutes, the first act, the second act of between 18 and 20, and then 25, 26, and you have this, this, this work, which has become one of the favorite and most compelling pieces of opera. It's amazing. Not included in the 228 people that I just introduced to you are 32 staff members of San Diego Opera, additional stagehands who loaded in and set up the scenery, the crew at the scenic shop, and 16 stitchers and crew in the costume shop who made all the alterations on the costumes. It adds up to 270 people. You know, I was so looking forward to my debut. And then I, of course, heard that that debut may not happen. And then to see and hear how the community, not just the San, San Diego community, but the larger operatic and classical world community came together to make sure that this company's legacy could continue and that a 50th season could be possible was, it made me that more excited. We're really focusing on getting out into the community and in trying to, uh, to break the stereotype that, that opera is an exclusive event and to make it an inclusive event and to really include everybody from the, the great fabulous donors that we have to the students that come to the very first night at the opera and to, to introduce them to this amazing art form.